All right, people, we're back. We're about to start Keith Campbell's talk. Uh, if you can tell, there is a large crowd to be at Little Things tonight for Keith's talk. Um, so maybe if you can't get in the door, join us via the live stream. And ask questions. Ask questions. Comment them. And we'll, we'll pose them to Keith during the Q&A session later. So while everybody's getting ready and getting ready to talk, I kind of wanted to show you every science cafe we try to do a specialty drink. And this week, or this month, we have $5. It comes with a beautiful picture. This is created by Jeremy in the blue shirt over there. It's got Goldschlager, vodka, OJ, garnished with a big leaf, of course a big leaf, piece of cotton candy. And for those interested, this is what the Donald looks like. And it tastes just like Goldschlager, which is what I would imagine a Donald Trump drink would taste like. Alright, so as we wait, I'm going to go and picture John. This is John. Hi, John. Cheers. Alright, I think we're getting ready. Uh, I will try to show the screen and then Keith simultaneously. How's it going? Thanks for coming out tonight on what feels like the first day of winter in mid-February. Um, thanks for coming to the Science Cafe. It's actually kind of a special night for us for more than one reason. Uh, of course, we're delighted to have Keith Campbell here, but uh, this is actually the three-year anniversary of the Science Cafe. Uh, thank you very much. I think we've had uh, about 30 cafes so far. Uh, and interestingly enough, Keith gave the very first one. Uh, low those many years ago. Uh, I know, I, I barely remember. Um, but uh, that cafe, Keith talked about the science of love. Uh, tonight, uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that this is a little bit more in your sort of central research focus, uh, and that is on the, the topic of narcissism, which, you know, if you don't know what narcissism is, it's kind of that inflated self, our sense of self-worth, this huge ego, and I, you know, I wish I could think of, a, of an example. But just nothing springs to mind, but, but Keith, uh, Keith has been studying narcissism for quite some time now, and gosh, in a variety of different uh, scenarios, from, uh, from romantic partnerships to, to young people, uh, the way they interact with, uh, with social media, um, but enough about Keith. Let's talk about me for a minute. So, uh, I've actually started this, uh, this social media thing myself, and I thought it would be fun if maybe we could get a selfie before the, before the So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's start. Could you just take a step that way? Just a, just a bit for That is perfect. I gotta tweet this out now. It's not me, it's the people who follow me who demand this. Another night in the awesome life of James. Hashtag YOLO. Hashtag King P. Hashtag blessed to be with me tonight. So, um, where were we? <laughs> oh, right. Uh, Kenneth here is going to talk about uh, Narcissus flowers and something like that. He's going to give us some gardening tips. I, I don't know. It, it, it'll, it'll be all right. Keith Campbell, everybody. Asking about because there's a lot of confusion 
with narcissism. Um, oh, that's better. Yeah. Please, James, thanks. <laughs> it's not all about you, pal. I know. I know. Um, but uh, I, there's a lot of confusion about the term, and people use it a lot of different ways. So I thought I'd give some examples. And there's sort of three ways we, we think about it. And one way, when most people think of narcissism, and I can already tell by the great part of Donald, is most, is, which is, I mean, that's hilarious, by the way. Um, but, but it's this grandiose self-presentation, it's extroverted confidence, grandiosity, also a sense of entitlement, maybe some callousness, manipulativeness, and it, it's, it's something you see in celebrities, politicians, it's easy to spot. We kind of, we're kind of drawn to it at the same time, it kind of messes us up. I always think of Putin, I, I don't know why I think of him riding a bear, but I just know <laughs> that's in his mind. He's always riding a bear with no shirt on in the tundra, uh, the taiga forest. And so grandiosity, the, the way it, it seems to work is you have high assertiveness, high confidence, boldness, you go out there and if people like you, you feel good about yourself and you keep doing that, you get more popular, you get a hotter girlfriend, a fancier car, and it, and it works really well and you, you feel good and, until somebody tells you you're a loser or you're not a winner or they mispronounce your name and then you get mad and get angry and that's when you get sort of stabilized. I'll show you that in a second. <laughs> and, and so this makes sense to most people. You can imagine people like, this. well, there's Kanye and Trump. When they met, I almost quit. The <laughs> I was like, I'm done. Um, but then there's this more vulnerable form, which gets confusing, where you're, you know, you have a sense of entitlement, you're self-centered, but you're also shy, maybe a little introverted, maybe a little paranoid, maybe you think you don't get the fame and acclaim that you deserve in life, but you're not really outgoing, so you're kind of anxious and depressed. Um, there, there's a few examples. Woody Allen plays some of these vulnerably narcissistic characters a lot. George Costan is an example, if anybody remembers Seinfeld. And my examples are so dated. I'm that like Scooby-Doo. Um, I always love the comic book guy from The Simpsons for this. Just because he, I don't know, it's, it's lost. I mean, no, it's safe when you teach and you're you know, giving Star Wars jokes. <laughs> yeah, they don't get it. But, um, but what's interesting is both these things. So the, the vulnerable form, we don't see, but if you're, if you're a, a clinical psychologist and people are coming into your practice and saying, you know, I've got these issues, no one pays attention to me and thinks how great I am, they end up seeing you and finding out you're sort of vulnerably narcissistic. So the clinicians, when they see narcissism, often see vulnerability because the grandiose narcissists don't go to therapy because it's freaking awesome. <laughs> the people in the business world, or the political world, or the, the theater world see the grandiose narcissists all the time. But these guys are kind of a pain in the butt, but they're, but they're pretty good at what they do. And so they tolerate it and they work. And, but then they both kind of wobble a little bit. So the grandiose folks occasionally will get reactive, often to criticize. So this is one of, I, I love Trump. I mean, this guy is, he's awesome. But this is when he, he attacked Meryl Streep for attacking him on Twitter. And that's sort of that classic grandiosity where somebody, somebody insults him and he's just got to get back. He's like, I got to show dominance again. Um, Kanye getting mad at Taylor Swift because she won an award. I, I didn't quite follow that. But. That's the kind of, that's when you see that grandiosity become a little vulnerable. But you also see the vulnerable folks becoming grandiose. And this is this, you know, this quote from Seinfeld. I can't read it because my eyes don't work anymore. But it's funny, I think. And, and this is the comic book guy thinking he's sort of a Spock or star guy. So both these forms kind of have this grandiose presentation, but maybe a little vulnerability, or have a lot of vulnerability and a little grandiosity. But what you don't find, and what people always think you find, is well, deep down inside Donald Trump is really Woody Allen. And I will promise, I don't know the man, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say a thousand percent, but 99 percent, deep down inside Donald Trump is probably Donald Trump. <laughs> He's probably not Woody Allen. Yeah. And so, and so this, this idea that these sort of people who are grandiose and self-promoting are really inside insecure and shallow and sick, it just doesn't seem to exist. I mean, at least we can't find it in the research. You do find people who are grandiose and vulnerable. You can't 
can't get that mix, and that's sort of interesting and hard to interpret. But, but this sort of this idea of narcissism mass is really real. Um, so I just said that. So they, so people used to think of this as like, how do we make sense of this modern building grandiosity? Well, maybe there's this Tutsi roll model or donut model with it. Grandiosity is a secret cover for the interior self-loathing or self-hatred. That doesn't really work. So we really think about it as three separate things. There's grandiose narcissism, there's horrible narcissism, and then narcissistic personality disorder, which is the clinical form. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But just to give you a little more idea of, of grandiosity, when we measure this in labs, we usually use self-report measures. These work really well. You just ask people things like, you know, check yes or no. If I rule the world, it would be a better place. I'd like somebody to write my biography. I'd like to look at myself in the mirror. And most of you said, yeah, I should rule the world, but I, I'm not that attractive. And I'm like, that's normal. People usually answer half of these. But if you're, you know, like Napoleon, if you're like, I want to rule the world, and I'm so awesome, I want people taking pictures of me and put it all over in paintings, then you go, well, maybe you've got an issue. Um, and vulnerability is different. It's, it's got, oh, there's a great item here. I wish I could read it. It's my favorite. I feel I have enough on my hands without worrying about other people's problems. <laughs> or other people's struggles. I love that question so much that I wanted to just put that up in my office door. Like, you know, I, I feel your pain in, in a way, but I just have enough on my hand without worrying about other people's troubles. So you get this, this sort of vulnerability and self-centeredness more with, with this, this vulnerable narcissism. And I don't need to go through all this in the interest of time, but the, the basic idea with the personality disorder is we have a trait like narcissism, and that trait becomes extreme, so you have very high narcissism. In the case of NPD, it's usually a combination of sort of grandiosity with some vulnerability. And it becomes pervasive and flexible, meaning you can't really turn it on and off. Like, I really don't want to be an arrogant jerk right now. I'll just I really don't want to be an arrogant jerk right now. I really don't want to be, I can't help it. I just have to be. Because it, it just, it, it's just part of me. I can't battle it down. And it's also pervasive across your life. So you could go work and be narcissistic. That might be fine. But if you go home and you're like telling your kids how awesome you are, then it starts to be problems. So, you, you know, most of us with personality, we regulate. We turn it on in some cases, we turn it off in others, we try to match the situation. Most of you are seen quiet and introverted right now. I love it. <laughs> but you're not that way in real life. Um, so when it gets extreme, and then and then it causes problems. So when you're very narcissistic, what tends to happen is you can ruin your relationships because people don't want to be with you. You can ruin your job because people don't want to work for you. Um, or you can really harm yourself by taking risks. You don't learn from feedback. You, you know, make mistakes, blame everybody else. You sort of start failing in life, and that can be a problem. So when those things happen, it can be clinical. These are the symptoms if you want to see them, but it's sort of lack of empathy, need for admiration, attention, want to hang out with special popular people, twice some narcissism, and pain drop, zero obsession, that kind of thing. But when you see people circulating, which has happened all the time now, because the reporters have me on a speed dial next to this election, and people are saying, look, Trump matches all these. He has MPD. I'm like, no, he's a billionaire. He's like a cartoon supervillain slash hero. <laughs> I mean, he's killing it. He's like president and a billionaire. And he has a helicopter and a plane. I mean, so, so yeah, he's got these symptoms, but I don't see the impairment yet. I mean, maybe he's there, but I, he's got a job, he's got a couple of them, I think he's got five. And, uh, so that impairment issue is really important, and that's why it becomes a diagnosis. Somebody's got to make the call about impairment. It's not just a checklist. A couple other things people ask. Um, oh, good. I'm not taking too long. A couple other people, people ask, are like, how do these traits work with other traits? Often, we'll talk about a dark triad, which is this combination, or not a combination, sort of a cluster of traits that go together. Narcissism, psychopathy, and sort of the, the more charming hand of electric kind of psychopathy. It's about factor one. It's a good kind of psychopathy. If you're going to be a psychopath, you want to be that kind. Did I say that? It's 
Right. Go ahead. But it's a lot of kids. you're more impulsive, and you're, you know, you're not as happy. It's a factor one, you know, sort of you know, more happy psychopathic. The Machiavellianism, which is a trait that's um, sort of high level of manipulative, manipulativeness. Yeah, well, there's, there's some great examples. They're great characters. They're very hard to find in real life because people often think they're really good at this, but they really are awful. But there's characters like the House of Cards guy who's kind of a psychopath too, but you, you know, manipulative. There's a guy in Game of Thrones called Littlefinger. Anybody watch Game of Thrones? I just want to see who the nerds were. I love that show. But, uh, but just these super manipulative characters, they're wonderful to watch. Um, and so those traits seem to go together, and if you heard the term dark triad, that's what people are talking about. There's also this more vulnerable triad, and what these tend to share is, is a lot of neuroticism, anxiety, depression. So you see this more vulnerable narcissism in there. You see um, borderline personality disorder, which looks a lot like vulnerable narcissism. In fact, I, I think it's a challenge to keep those two apart. Um, and you see this more impulsive, more depressive sort of psychopathy or antisocial. So these, these things are sometimes talked about as puzzles. There's no, this is the other thing, when people are like, are you A or B or C? I'm like, yeah, it's not that clean. You know, it's like, what's the difference between a burrito and a taco? Well, you roll the taco like this, and it's a burrito. You know, so it's, it, it's sort of like that. Does that make any sense? I think it's, yeah. <laughs> So these things, are, these things are very close. They're closely related, and it's very hard to draw very clear cutoffs between them. Uh, so you're talking about those sort of, these sort of clusters. And then I, I, they sort of come up with questions, and here are the general questions I get. Um, I never did this question, but actually I, I thought of this. When I started saying narcissism, I thought, what's interesting about narcissism isn't, isn't just what it does in culture, but also how it shows you how the self works. So if you're narcissistic, you're always making yourself feel like a 10, even if you're a 7. And you have to go through all these games to keep that 10 going, get the right relationship, get the right job, get the right car, manipulate the right friends, do the right things on Facebook, the hashtag winning. I love the class. I love the class. Um, I that was funny. Um, you know, so that so you just kind of see how the self works. Well, all of us have a self that sort of works like that. Maybe we care more about being close to people, belongingness. Maybe we care more about exploration or feelings. But a lot of what we do, we, we sort of do in these these different ways. Narcissism is just really easy to see. So it's kind of a fun thing to look at. Second is the evolutionary question. I don't really have a great answer to, it, you know, but other people. To, um, sort of why this exists in the first place and it's so bad. I mean, there's a few answers to it. Um, there's a leadership question, which I think everybody cares about, which is why why do we see narcissism and leadership seem to go together so often? Which they, which they do. That was that relationship question. Why do I keep dating narcissistic? Even though I know they're bad for me. I've got that one once or twice. <laughs> Um, and then the social media question, which is my best is some the reporters like, what do you see happening next? <laughs> like, are you insane? I didn't predict people would be running around taking pictures of themselves. And my seven-year-old would spend all the time, all her time, taking photos of herself and making music videos. That's insane. <laughs> Who would have predicted that? We have a reality star president. No one predicted this. This is crazy. I can't predict anything. I don't know what's going to happen. But it's interesting. So, those are my questions. So, James, when everybody drinks now, and then they're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, that's the idea. So, if you'd like to uh, take a quick break, run to the bathroom, uh, go grab a drink, please do. You know, I find it interesting. I didn't know there were good kinds of psychopaths, and I think it's, I think it's, I think so it's great. Maybe you've got a choice. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, if, if you've got a choice, you'd rather be like the intelligent Hannibal Lecter, like fly ahead and stop it. You know, you don't want to be the put the lotion in the basket kind of stuff. I've got it. Okay, so yes, let's let's take a quick five minute break so and then we'll come back and we'll we'll take some questions. All right, we're back. We're in intermission after Keith's talk. And James is 
fairly accurate, both Hannibal, incredibly accurate, Hannibal and and what's the? Uh, I believe his title is Lotion in the Basket Guy. Lotion Hannibal. the Basket Guy. There, he has a name though. Lotion in the Basket. Guy. Okay, okay. We'll have to look it up. IMDb it or something. Uh, it's very good impression though. It's kind of scary how good James was at that. Yeah. Anyway, if anyone has questions, feel free to comment them. Keith kind of prompted us with some awesome ones himself. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am personally interested in, one, why are narcissists also leaders? Because of uh, somebody who runs our country. It's true. Yeah, you know. The other one, as a person who takes a lot of selfies, is that narcissistic? Absolutely. Are you sure, though? I mean... Absolutely. I'm sure. I'm are you positive. positive? Okay. I think John is running away. I'm live... We are live streaming the event from Science Cafe for posterity, as well as for people who can't attend cafes, because, as you can tell, we have a packed house, and standing in the back is a little bit difficult. So we're currently live streaming to all of our science fans. Anyway... Mackenzie, you want to be on a live stream? Not really? Not really? Okay, well, we're still live streaming. So it's me and James. What's up, James? Hello. Well, so your, your impressions were quite accurate. You think? And a little terrifying. Well, I am kind of a terrifying guy. That is... Legend. Epic. Anyway. We kind of run out of things to yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know, know if that's painfully obvious. We're also very new to the live stream. So yeah. Are you terrible. supposed to write stuff down for this? I don't really know. I don't know. Technology kind of frightens me. <laughs> are we doing this right? Maybe. Hopefully. We're still airing, so, you know, that's a thing. I don't guess there's a way to do it wrong, necessarily. Well, no, there definitely is, but... I mean, yeah, there is. We'll learn as we go. We're learning on the job. That's as we right. Do. And, um, That's right. Um, so, out of Pete's questions that he prompted, I think I am most interested in one: leaders and narcissism, because you know the Donald. And it's my impression. That's award-winning impression, people. And two, the act of taking a selfie, because as you know, I take a lot of selfies. Uh, if you anyone recalls the flyer for this month. It's a drawing that I made of a picture I took of myself yeah, yeah. taking a picture. Yeah, plus it's, uh, it's gainful. That makes that's, sense, right? That's, that's a... It's a lot of narcissistic inception. That's a level of narcissism that I didn't know existed. Buffalo Bill. That's the lotion of the basket guy. Thank you. Correct. We couldn't remember the name. Hannibal Lecter, Buffalo Bill. Come on, Clarice Starling. I remembered, I remembered Hannibal Lecter and Clarice Starling. Thank you. Though. Yes, Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill. To whoever is the big uh, Silence of the Lambs fan, I salute you. Yeah, James salutes you. And the rest of us are a little creeped out by his impressions. Yeah, that. Anyway, I have to go do things. You have to go do things. You want to try to get everyone back together? Okay. All right, so I'm going to go back to my spot and try to continue the live stream. Again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to, uh, to uh, type them in.
Yeah, let's try, try to get out of the government. Nobody that's ever trains the government. So, right away, Keith, if you wouldn't mind, could you uh, repeat the question so that folks in the back can hear? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, in front. So one of the one of the most interesting ways you can test this is give people um, questions with no answers. So do you know the battle of Salvist and Gold? And people are narcissistic be like, oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> so you can you can do things like that, and, and you'll see more of that dishonesty, and you'll see more game playing in relationships, so that kind of dishonesty. But in terms of the compulsive line, it's not it's not correlated, I mean, or if it is, it's very, very small. Yeah. Yeah? What is the most effective way to deal with that? <laughs> well, I, I mean, it depends on what, what's the context of that, because, yeah, the qu question is what's the most effective way to deal with narcissists, and I think it, it very much depends on what context you're referring to. Do you have one in mind? I <laughs> <laughs> that God, I know it's Athens, Georgia. This would be so different down south. Um, I've been asked that question too, once or twice, and I it's it, it's a I mean it's a challenging it's challenging when you're in a relationship with somebody who's narcissistic, and you, you know the, the usual thing is just bail if it's bad, just get out. Um, but that's hard to do if you're married to somebody, or if you've got a job and you know you're dealing with your boss, and you can't get rid of your boss, or a leader, or president, or whatever. Um, my my answer, and I think the biggest challenge is that what you want, if, if somebody's creating a sort of a fantasy of or a mask or image of greatness or yeah, grandiosity, I mean, what you want is reality to sort of to sort of counter that. You need proof to counter that. So if you're dating somebody and they're like, I'm awesome, you're like, dude, I looked you up and you're, you're, you're the CEO of a company that's only one person in it. You know, it's, <laughs> that, that's questionable. So you, want, you generally want truth in the mix to, to, to make judgments. And the challenge in our country now is that the, the organ of truth, which is the, the media, is kind of off the rails. And people don't really know where to find truth, and so we, we're kind of in these different bubbles, and this is a very long conversation, I'm not the best expert on it, but it's it's very hard to even deal with it because everybody gets to it from their own place. But I think that would be the general answer, is finding some ground of truth. Yeah? Do they know that they're aligned? Lying or narcissistic, which one? Second one, so my boss lies <laughs> But I don't think he actually thinks he's lying. He'll change, he'll tell the same story 10 different times and he's trying to get You're like, like and yeah. yeah, it's like a, the old fishing stories. Yeah. There's, there's not, I mean, a couple things. One, people who are narcissistic, 
know it. I mean, it's not like a, it should be a surprise. Like, and, and, and same with people psychopathic. They're like, yeah, I look at it for number one. You're an idiot not to. So, you know, yeah, I, I'd like somebody to write a biography about me. But who doesn't? Only a loser. So, so I don't think there's, some, there's not a secret. That's why we can measure narcissism. You can ask people, are you narcissistic? And they'll say, yes. Um, so it's not, I think there's a lot of self-awareness. Now the challenge though is do, do memory systems work in the service of self-enhancement, which is sort of what you're asking. I just put a fancy professor here in Columbia. That's 20 years of grad school right there. Um, but, but the idea is, is your memory system get distorted in a way that makes you look better? And, and especially in the retelling of it. And the answer is memory systems do work like that. People are narcissistic, and the two or three studies that have been done, and there's not enough, do seem to do that more than others. Um, I think it's something people often do, depending on changes and stuff. But yeah, you, you, you do see that. Yes? What is borderline personality disorder? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> the question is, what is borderline personality disorder? You know, what Jessica, you want to answer? What do you want to know? I, I mean, this is... I mean, I do know a lot about it. I know. This is so wrong. Yeah. Come up here in case yes. I miss something. Yes. Uh, Generally, this is my grad student, Jessica McCain. Everybody. Whenever, whenever I say, like, I did research, it's referring to her or one of these folks back here. That's, a, that's another secret. Um, Borderline personality disorder, you think of like the classic examples of Play Misty for Me or Who's the Bro in the Rock Rapid Woman. I went old school, Play Misty. Yeah. Play Close. Play yeah. Close. Yeah. Or Angel Fatal Attraction. Fatal Attraction. Or Angela Gina Lowe. Angela Jolie in almost yeah. every movie. Yeah. <laughs> Girl Interrupted. Girl Interrupted. But it's. It, it, you, Actually, you, no, Winona. 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 She's the. She's the the other one is like that. I was like, but, I don't know what Winona Ryder well, is supposed to have in that movie. I was like, she's a girl to me. I mean, I think Jessica's going to interrupt if I, I mean, there's a very long symptom list, and you can you can pull like 25 or 400 different combinations to end up with borderline. It's very confusing. I think at the base is difficulty in affect regulation. You have emotions are hard to control and so you get very dysregulated. Sometimes you see people try to regulate with cutting, um, impulsive, behavior. impulsive behavior, overeating, other sort of that kind of yes, impulsive like stuff, self-destructive behaviors. Um, attachments become very black and white. They used to call it like what switched object relations, like the old uh, school splitting. Thing, splitting. So you'd be like, I love you, I hate you, and it'd be like the same week. Um, so you get these very dramatic things, over attachment, which is why you're boiling the rabbit in the movie. Those are the main, it's, I think the core is affect regulation, you yeah. know, what other keys. Uh, Marshall Linehan's model is, uh, is um, pervasive dysregulation in most areas. Of so not just but, uh, Most of the time it comes from trauma, so childhood trauma of some sort. Um, the vast majority of borderlines, I think, tend to report um, some sort of abuse or trauma in childhood, and this leads to an inability to regulate yourself, especially your emotions. So it has this weird grab bag of symptoms, but that's because you know the underlying inability to regulate emotions spirals out into all areas of your life. You have your PhD material right there. I, I just, yeah, I think the core, the core is from people like, that's why it looks a lot like vulnerable narcissism, because a lot of it is that, that sort of affect regulation. Back there. So um, I've been hearing a lot about malignant narcissism, I believe is the word that they've been yeah, talking about. Yeah, malignant, the question is, what is malignant narcissism? Yeah, what do you find online and when people talk, they come up with all these different kinds of narcissism, like malignant narcissism, or so there's communal narcissism, which we actually have research on. Any other narcissisms that I should talk about? Malignant's the big one now. Yeah. yeah. The idea of malignant narcissism was, it was this grandiose narcissism, but also incorporated some sadism and maybe some more psychopathic traits, so it was more dangerous. And so, hence malignant, bad narcissism. Um, is it pervert? Uh, for which term? 
Anyway, one of the old sites have been amateur. But people would use it with leadership. They're like, well, that person's not just narcissistic. They're a malignant narcissist, which means they're going to world and destructive things, which maybe is rude for people talking about it. Yeah, I think after the first week of Trump. Yeah, they use it a lot. It's not, there's no way of trying. There's no malignant narcissism scale. But what they mean is narcissism with a little dab. I mean, along with my Mexican food metaphor, so I think about this stuff. It's like a little special seasoning on narcissism. It makes you sadistic and, and maybe um, especially dangerous. Yeah. Yes, back in back with the Georgia sweatshirt. Hi. Well, there's a there's a couple answers. The question is about the that the harm from the impairment in narcissistic personality has to happen to the person rather than something else. There's a couple answers to that one is if you have a if you can be determined to have a disorder if you're harming other people. So people who are psychopathic that murder somebody are like, well that's the problem. You know, even if you felt real good about that. <laughs> <laughs> And narcissism is similar. So one of the problems you could, you know, one of the, the impairments you could have is actually harming those around you. So, but in terms of the, the context, that's reasonable as well. So you can think of situations where it's like, you know what, I, really, I need a malignant narcissist right now because I'm fighting these guys and I need somebody who's angry and willing to do whatever it takes to win and who's competitive and doesn't care. And then you go, okay, we're done, now stop, be nice. <laughs> And it's very hard to adjust for some people, and that's where you get into trouble, where certain contexts really pull for, for very narcissistic traits, and then and then to be able to move to other contexts can be hard for people. So you, you wouldn't really see them in, in, in certain, you wouldn't really see the narcissism in certain contexts where everybody's narcissistic. Take that away and then you might see them. Yeah? What is the current thinking on the ideology? There's, uh, what's the current, the question was, what's the thinking of the ideology of narcissism or where it comes from? There's, there's a few different things with grandiose narcissism and with vulnerability narcissism. You see some sort of heredity or some sort of genetic component. Just like most traits, it's relatively high, I guess, say 0.6 with the heredity, the heredity coefficient. Doesn't quite mean it's, you know, 60% heritable, but it means it's pretty darn heritable. You're, you're sort of born with that. Um, there's also some parenting issues with grandiose narcissism. You, you see them report their parents were maybe a little permissive, put them on a pedestal. Um, with vulnerable narcissism, you see the same thing you do with most personality disorders, like borderline. You see parents who are cold and controlling, maybe abusive. So you see more problems with the vulnerable narcissism. There's also culture. I mean, certain cultures seem to Pull for narcissism or reward it, which is us, or especially us before the collapse. I mean, it was awesome. And so that's what pulls for narcissism. In other cultures, maybe, you know, pilgrims probably weren't pulling for as much narcissism. You'd have to work to keep it, you know, you'd have to be the best Bible reader or something. <laughs> it's harder to do, you know? So there are these cultural things as well that, that seem to play a role. You know? Yes? <laughs> how, do you, how do you help a narcissist seek professional help? That's one of the biggest, um, that's one of the real challenges with any work on therapy with, with narcissism, you know, even counseling or even, you know, psychotherapy if it's clinical, is that people who are more grandiose, they don't really think they have that much of an issue. And, and even when they seek treatment, there's a lot of dropout, very high dropout rate. So, but a few studies we have suggest that people that go into therapy, it doesn't seem to matter so much which kind, seem to get some improvement. From, they get some self-awareness, they get some training, you know, some social skills, they can, they can do better. Um, but having them stay in therapy is really a challenge. The, 
So what's the question? I didn't add. Do you like that? I'm just going to skirt it around the whole question. <laughs> Convince them it's their idea. Oh, I like that. Seriously, convince them it's their best interest. What? Do you really think we should go into therapy because that's what all the cool people do? I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, if you really think that's what's best. Um, yeah. I honestly think, I, I mean, I think I think that or an ultimatum or um, some people sometimes they get drug, dragged in there with drug or alcohol problems, sometimes relational problems. But I, I think it's it's a challenge. And no, I, I think it keeps the course. <laughs> well, that's the, I mean, there's one story. It was one of his masters said this this you know really high level psychoanalytic guy, psychiatrist in New York, and said he was in the paper, and about how great he was. And he had 13 narcissists come the next day to see treatment. And he said, "Well, I'm busy, but you can see one of my associates," and they all left. But they were like they were willing to do treatment with him because he had been in the New York Times. It was a big deal. So that's the kind of thing. It's sort of if you think about any of these things, it's like, and how do you align ego needs or, or their enhancement needs or esteem needs? Align that with what you want them to do. That's the challenge. I don't know. Uh, yes. Is there any research on narcissists who abuse drugs or alcohol? Like, are they more likely? Yeah, you find that with with vulnerability, you do. Uh, you find a lot of. Uh, mood issues. You see it with grandiose narcissism, it's not huge. Um, but you do find a little, you know, you find a correlation with alcohol abuse, you find a little bit with cocaine. That was one of the things that, you know, narcissism and cocaine in the 70s were like this perfect triumvirate of goodness. Um, I didn't just say, we're not on campus. We're not on campus. We're at a bar. It's okay. Um, yeah, you get a little bit, but it's not a it's not a huge effect. Yeah, uh, I guess in front of that. Yeah. Hey. No, I just no. Um. I, I wish I I just I wish I knew more because people who are really into evolutionary psychology have such great thoughts about this and and they're much more precise than I do. The general, I mean, one argument is a good mating strategy because it's good for starting short-term relationships, so it should work. Um, so that's that's one explanation, and, and it seems... The, 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 well, yeah, there is a gender difference. With narcissism, it's higher in men than women. The correlation is about, with, with grandiose, vulnerable, there's no difference. With grandiose, it's about, it's the correlation is about 0.2. I don't know how to say that in human terms. It's not that big a difference. And um, with, with uh, diagnosis of narcissistic personality, it's about three to one men to women. So I don't know how much of that stereotypes and how much it's real, but it is more male. And it does seem to work for short-term mating. Um, so that, that's one. It could work in certain situations. So you sort of a chaotic environment, narcissism would work, but a stable environment it doesn't. So there's some idea that it's, a, it's sort of adaptive in these certain contexts that, yeah, that it would really work. Um, there's this other paper that just came out like two days ago on how human culture spread. And the idea was that if, in a group, you have a, you have a, a small group of hunter-gatherers, and you get a couple of people who are just kind of lie and cheat and steal stuff and hit on people's girlfriends, whatever you call them, mates. And then they then they kick them out, and they go start their own colony, and then they start working with that colony. So it was, it, maybe it was something that was, rather than being killed, it sort of was allowed to spread. I mean, there's some idea that's happened, but I know there's some other more technical things that I don't know. Yeah. I, I read it two days ago, literally. It's fascinating. They, they never said narcissism, but I, I, I mean, a lot of what we're trying to think about is how does narcissism, you know, it works really well on the web, and it, it, it spreads really well in these certain contexts. It's really adaptive. Um, it could also be that narcissism, that, you know, if, if narcissism's 10 points and you're on a 7, that's awesome. You go to 9, you get into trouble. So it could be one of those things that's adaptive and it's sort of a in sort of a high, moderate range. There's a little research that shows that, but then others that doesn't, but that's a possibility as well. Okay, behind you. Um, how do you get under the skin of a grandiose narcissist? And specifically, people are putting out this idea 
idea of writing letters to President Bannon. Do you think that's a question? But the question is the question I really want you to answer. <laughs> okay, no, the question was how do you get under the skin of a grandiose narcissist who happens to be president? <laughs> and funny story, um, I had a, this year we had a political season and I, I had a call from a reporter saying, are you the one advising in Hillary's campaign? And I said, no. And they said, well, she's paying psychologists to get her to, how uh, to help her, you know, debate Donald Trump. And I said, well, not me, I could have used the money. <laughs> so, but then some on Daily Beats, one of these online things, said, hey, would you write an article before the debate on how to debate a narcissistic candidate? And I said, sure, that would be fun. And it's not that complicated. It's like, how did you just get under their skin and you do it in a subtle enough way that other people don't see it? And that's exactly what Hillary did in the debate. She started calling him Donald right away. Totally humiliating. Um, and then she, she started, she said, what was it? Howard Dent. He got all his money from his father. And so you could just see she, she derailed him almost immediately. He became a little dysregulated. And so that's the kind of thing you do. It's those kind of those kind of slights um, that, that I think, and I, there's no evidence that it'd be be, it's better to be under the radar than sort of over. But I think if it's too over the top, other people see it. And if you can do it more subtly, that would work. But, you know, I don't know, President, what was it, President Bannon? Yes. Yeah, that would probably bother him a little. <laughs> but I mean, it's not, I mean, it's too late. Come on. You, I mean, it was, it, it, you had a campaign. People think that Bannon is the real people guy, so. Oh, I, I don't, I don't know. I, no one, I wasn't involved with anything. I'm just saying that's what happened. I watched the debates, it worked perfectly. The other advice would be, the other thing with narcissism and, Political context is that if you if things are stable, people want moderate, moderate, non-changed leaders. If things are chaotic and scary, they want strong narcissistic leaders. And so the other thing is you you paint you paint things as calm. No one wants Trump in charge. You paint them as scary. They like where's Trump? And if I can't get him, I want Putin and his freaking bear. <laughs> That's how the system works. I mean, so it wasn't that complicated. I mean, psychologically. Um, but that's sort of that. That's the kind of thing that's where. Yes, over here. Subcultures tend to be more narcissistic than others. Yeah. The question is, are there cultural differences in narcissism? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, both across cultures, where and and, it, and I, I can say it's a little hard to tell this because we use self-report measures to measure a lot of this, and people tend to compare themselves to each other. So Germans are like, yeah, we're not that organized. You know, I mean, I only, I only you know, changed my sheets five times this week. I mean, it, I mean hey. um, so there's some issues. But generally, when you look at it, you find, you find a lot of the Far East countries a little lower, except for China, which seems to, I mean, mainland China, whatever we call it now, I don't know. What do they, they call China now? PRC, is that still? Anyway. China, China, um, like Taiwan, has higher higher narcissism scores. But but Japan is generally pretty low. A lot of places Southeast Asia are generally low. Um, we're relatively high. Latin America is relatively high. Um, Europe's a little lower than we are. But but uh, we're working on one study now with like sixty countries, and I, I would be able to answer this really well in about six months. But it but again, it's hard to say that for sure. The U.S. is usually in the top, and, and if you ask people how do you see the U.S., typical U.S. person, which is sort of a stereotype, they see us as a very narcissistic country um, because of our, but it's not, it's not hateful, it's just because we're sort of grandiose and outspoken and do stuff. And, um, and, yeah, it's all the way in back. Um. Other than politicians, are there any fields that seem to particularly attract narcissists? Uh, the question is, are there any fields that attract narcissists besides politics? Um, professors. professors. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, they actually had this great study looking at different 
like the, the stereotypes of professors in different fields. And it was the business was the highest. And then I walked by and they're like, I'm like, you didn't include law. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but um, no, what you what you tend to see is higher scores in and, and these aren't great data. It's not like there's been a national survey done. It's just looking at samples and comparing. So within medicine, one big study, surgeons are more narcissistic surgeons, than yeah, inter or internists. <laughs> and you go, well, of course, that's crazy. They're all narcissistic. And like, yeah, but if you had to kill people and you had to cut people's hearts open, I mean, I couldn't do it. I'd just start shaking, you know? I, I mean, we need that thing. I think it's something that works. Um, in, in the clergy, you see higher narcissism in the people with bigger congregations. So it does seem that there are there's narcissism in the clergy. There's people doing work on this. Um, celebrity. Any place where you can get business students that are higher than psych majors. Um, so whenever you whenever there's whenever there's a more opportunity for sort of success, status, power attention, that's going to be a pull for narcissism. But it's going to, you know, people are in politics for lots of reasons. I mean, it's not just ego. That's just one. It just makes it attractive. So you think about it, it's like, what would be attractive for somebody who can get ego needs met? And any field that does that is going to attract a higher level of narcissism. Yes? Um, looking at the human historical record, can you find uh, kind of a time point where a narcissist the question was, if you look at history, or the time period, can you see a time where narcissism had its first impact? The answer is, I've got to make something up quickly. Um, it's, actually, it's actually very interesting. It's a complicated question. That's my stall. Um, historically, if you look at you know, if you look at hunter-gatherer groups, you did have people who are narcissistic, like I said, and they were either killed or pushed out of groups when the groups were small. And so as long as we were hunter-gatherers, we were able to keep it in check. And when you got more agricultural communities, you'd have this hierarchy, and then you'd have a pharaoh or a king or somebody, and that person would be a god. So is that narcissism or is that I mean, I don't know if I, I what I call, you know, Ramsey's the second a narcissist, or I'm like, he's just a guy. I don't know. It's such a strong social role. So you, you see that. You see a lot. And that was when, when sort of leaders started identifying with the solar system. So sun kings, and, you know, I guess there's sun but they moon kings too. I don't know. I don't know. Rain kings. They did have rain kings. I think they Tonga or something. Or Togo. Maybe it was Togo. But... So you see that, and then you see some of the Greek stuff. So you see, you see hubris, which is that that sort of uh, that sort of pride that's somewhat self-defeating. So the story of Icarus is a great example of that. We have a guy who's just going for it, but just goes a little too far. So that's a, that's a theme you see in a lot of, of I mean Achilles. You see it in a lot of great mythic stuff. And there's another there's another word for narcissism in Greek, and I totally forgot. Excuse me, matter. I don't have any idea what it was, but I knew it at one point. But I think that numerous idea in Greek and of course the myth, myth of Narcissus. And so in Greek culture, it was something people thought about a lot. So that was kind of my where I was going to. Could we have mistaken Narcissus in old times with Eros? I think they went together. I mean, that's the thing, but there's another, there was another word for it in Greek that wasn't hubris, and that's what I'm forgetting because I had the same question and talked to a, uh, you know, a Greek historian historical expert, there's another sort of term that was a lot like modern narcissism. And that's why I think, I, I mean, I think narcissism is a trade-off. I mean, it, it's, you know, it can lead to great stuff if it works. And if it doesn't work, it can be a disaster. And that's the problem. And that was that tension. All those Greek stories where the people were like, I'm the best ever. And then they just like, except for my heel. You know, and so it's always, you know, but there's this great tension. And then in the Christian tradition, you know, there was this, this idea of pride, but that pride was always sort of a problem. And pride went before the fall, and then in uh, Inferno, why am I talking about this little bar? I think it was Paradise Lost, they started talking about, you know, maybe your, your pride is godly, and then anyway, we had all these historical tensions about even self-esteem and pride until about the 60s. 
And then we just said self-esteem's good, and narcissism sort of a side effect, and it's not so good. Yeah. Well, I get points better around right? a little bit. Yeah. So, what's the role of technology? I think it's um, I think it's both. I think narcissism has gone up. I think it's I think it's been going down since the recession. So I don't think it's kept going up. But that stuff isn't published yet, so I'm just telling you. But I, I'm not going to say that for sure. I, I think it's higher now than the 60s still. I think technology and social media in particular is fascinating. I've got several students here who've done a lot of work on it. Um, what you find with social media are people who are narcissistic use it as a tool to self-enhance. So they use it to promote themselves, they use it to get attention, and they tend to be good at it. So people who are narcissistic have more friends, they have more connections, they have more um, more sort of self-promoting content in their, in their social media use. They take more selfies. Uh, they take more shirtless selfies. <laughs> more shirtless selfies. It certainly looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we think more shirtless selfies, but definitely more body, more body, not just a shirtless, more skin. So they, so people are narcissistic use it for self promotion. So when you look at your feed and whatever feed people do anymore, what you're likely to see is more narcissism than than you would see here. Because what you're getting are people who are narcissistic, you're probably more connected to them, and they're probably putting out a little more content. You're probably distorting your world a little bit to see more narcissism. The question on is social media turning people narcissistic? I don't, I think the data on that are really mixed. I think we found some studies that they do, some they don't. I think my bigger concern now is that social media is actually leading to a lot of depression, a lot of, a lot of body image stuff. Um, and that's actually what I'm more worried about. Like my kids taking pictures of the, I mean, I, I did one selfie, when the first time, I did one with a student, and then they wanted me to do a book cover or a magazine, one of the Georgia people, and they're like, take a selfie, and I couldn't go, like, uh. And then I took one, I'm like, you are so fat and disgusting, you jump in a hot looking gray son of a gun. And, so I had to take like a fake selfie. So he just took a camera picture of me and then like pretended, and then I put it on my camera and then we pretended it was a selfie. And I couldn't do it. I'm too freaking neurotic. But if I were narcissistic, I would take like five and then one of those like action shots like with the bear and then tweeted it. And then what you would have seen it and gave me a like or whatever and I would have felt good. And there's a lesson there somewhere. I don't know what it is. That was a great answer. Uh, I'm with you. Um, no, I, I mean, look at look historically. I mean, we, we have one study where we had historian ratings of presidential narcissism. It didn't include Trump. My guess on Trump would he would be near the top. And that's of a very elite group of... If you look at who's high, who comes out very high on those things is people like Lyndon Johnson, Nixon, uh, Clinton's pretty high, uh, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and what happened with those? Well, Nixon didn't get impeached, but he gave up before, uh, before because he knew where it was going. So he sort of preserved himself that way. Teddy Roosevelt started the Bull Moose Party, I think, because he got pissed off at everybody and just started his own. Um, Johnson, I guess he went to the ranch. I don't, I don't know enough. If you ever read about John Snow, he was a monster. I'm on, I'm on tape right now. So I get a quick interruption from the Alex Jones channel. He assassinated Kennedy. And I'm, I'm just saying, he seemed like a monster to me. Pardon? Oh. Yeah, so I, yeah, he, I mean, if you go read some of his book, he was a monster, but he got a lot done. He's like a monster who gave his Civil Rights Act. 
ain't got this in Vietnam, and, and they kept us there because of his ego. So my, my answer is, I don't know exactly what would happen. I, I think, it's, I think it's, it's a scary thought, and you don't want it to happen. You know, that's the thing. You just, and you can see, <laughs> you can see stuff going really, I mean, what you see with narcissistic leaders is, you see ethical problems in the presidency, They're, they do great things, and often they do disastrous things. So you get, you get, a, you don't get Jimmy Carter, you know. You don't get like, hey, you get this kind of stuff, and it, and it's, and it's entertaining but terrifying. Um, and and so, but but it's funny with presidents, you know, who's the most respected ex-president? It's probably Jimmy Carter, maybe. He's not a he's not a very narcissistic leader. I mean, you, I mean, they make fun of him for being boring. And, um, and being scared of a rabbit. That was one of my favorite Saturday Night Live skits. You go watch him, they're hilarious. But he, but people respect it now because they think he's a good man, yeah. you know? Yeah? Has there ever been a narcissistic leader that transitioned as conditions change, as the environment change? Or once a narcissist, always a um, That's a, okay, the question is, has there been a leader who transitioned with the environment from narcissism to less narcissism? Um, yeah, I was going to say, there might be some, is that one? Schwarzenegger. That's actually a good example. I was, gonna, I was going for Pinochet, and I, I know there's still a lot of people in Chile are upset by that, but um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is actually, I think, a very confident man, and um, some might say incredibly narcissistic, but, you know, and, and he went into leadership, and he kind of did a bunch of bold stuff, and it didn't work, and he started wearing a green tie. And that, I mean, so yeah, that's actually great, thank you. That was a great, I'm using that for now. That's my new go-to. I say Augustus, I just, I, everything I learned about like history was surprised from watching one of these like horrible, what? I got a second question for the follow-up. Okay, follow-up.
you know, they're like, I think I, that's usually what it is. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm missing something. I've sort of got old and I see what my friends have and maybe I'm missing something. Um, and I want to... Now I'm saying you're narcissistic. <laughs> no, that, but that's usually what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's very, I mean, frequency is a hard one because you can look at the, at the clinical definition and try to get a frequency of that. And the, the last big survey estimated that the lifetime prevalence was, for young people, was actually 11%. Um, but I think that's a real overestimation. I think it's more like... 2%, maybe you got sort of a 1 or 2% where it's sort of clinical NPD. In terms of the scale, it, it's hard to say a line, like, well, this is the line where we call it narcissism. It's, it's a lot like, you know, people say I'm an introvert. Well, what does that mean? Introversion is a, it's a, it's a, it's a continuum. That means you're sort of high on it, but we don't really have a good definition of it. So it's, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. So we use the word narcissist like it's a thing. Um, but it's really not that clear. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Well, you want to pick the person? I'm going to feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't asked a question? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll give it to this lady. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Come on. Be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good question. Uh, that's question. That was my question. So the question was, is there a clinical term for the polar opposite of narcissism? And that's it's a hard one to answer because there is something called dependent personality disorder, which is related to depression, which in some ways is somewhat of an opposite of narcissism. If you think of narcissism as dominance and dependence as lowerness, it's lowerness. <laughs> I love your take. <laughs> so it's like narcissism's do dominance and dependency is lenosity, low lenosity. Um, that might be one way to think about it as the opposite of narcissism. And mythically, it would be echo. So it would be some, somebody who's sort of submissive but also needy and dependent. So sort of dependent personality, maybe. The other way to think about the nar opposite of narcissism is sort of humility or even egolessness, where you're just like, man, I just... I mean, if you ever listen to Dalai Lama talk, he's a politician. He's confident, but he has this bare, this presence that, like, there's no ego, you know, which is amazing. Um, so, so there is this sort of idea you could just the whole self system is just not really working. I'm just, I'm just here, um, which would really be a disorder unless you're applying for college and your essay is how come, how are you awesome, and then you can even say, like, no, I don't, I'm not really here. Um, but I would think more dependence or some sort of dependency would be, would be what you're asking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. If you'd like to learn more about narcissism, personality disorders, depression, uh, psychopaths, uh, <laughs> Just uh, just head on down to the psychology department and we see it. It's full of them. Ah. Yeah. Um, all right, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, Keith said he could hang out for a little bit, so if you answered, uh, if your question didn't get answered, uh, come on up here. But um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Get home safe. James, we have surveys. I'm sorry, what? Surveys and... Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We actually have some surveys uh, at the back. Um, so, you know, please fill one of those out. It kind of helps us figure out what we want to do next, how we can change things up a little bit. And right next to that is... I don't know, the donation box. You know, so you could put money in it. But thank you all very much for coming. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is another successful cafe. Uh, if you want more information about the Athens Science Cafe, go to our website, www.athensciencecafe.com. Follow us, obviously, you follow us on Facebook. We also have a Twitter, at SciCaf. 
Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.